when I go to a Jehovah Witness function, um, I don't play by their rules. Uh, some folks get pretty upset that I, uh, I don't tell them right away that I'm a former Jehovah's Witness or that I'm an apostate. Well, first and foremost, I'm not an apostate. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to play by your rules. I don't, I don't uh, recognize the authority of the watchtower. Therefore, I don't have to live and, uh, and abide by their uh, man-made rules. Hi, Brian. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate you taking the time out of your busy day. I recently met you in Sacramento, California, a couple of weeks ago. It was so nice to meet you. And um, I just really wanted to hear your story again. And um, I'm just basically going to give you the floor. So if you will, tell me about, um, you know, how long you were a Jehovah's Witness, how you got in, and um, what made you exit the organization? Yeah, well, thanks for having me, Elaine. It's a pleasure meeting you at the conference several weeks ago as well. And, uh, you know, I grew up as one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, my mom and dad were Jehovah Witnesses. My mom actually became a Jehovah Witness just in time for Armageddon in 1975. Mm -hmm. And uh, instead of uh, being disillusioned by it, she kept with it. And uh, she's been serving the organization uh, ever since. Um, and so I grew up under that um, household of a Jehovah Witness. Uh, I actually really enjoyed being a Jehovah's Witness. I loved being different. I loved that, uh, you know, I can tell my teachers that I don't have to send up for the flag, uh, you know, a lot, a lot of things which kids now do anyways, but uh, I had a good reason back then to uh, not stand up for the for the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, you know, I, it, it was interesting being a Jehovah's Witness. I really believed it. Um, my mother and my father did instill in me uh, really good uh, Bible values, and I got to learn about the Bible stories, um, yeah, reading the scriptures, and um, really getting a foundation for a biblical worldview, which uh, you know I still hold to till this day as a Christian. Um, and my mother, especially, was very devout in the Jehovah Witnesses, uh, and I've never, uh, at that point, had never known anyone who knew the Bible more than my mom. And so I like to say that I get the love of the Bible from my mother, uh, who really does love uh, the Word of God, uh, even though she's a Jehovah's Witness and is an error even till this day. Um, but yeah, that's kind of my my upbringing in the Jehovah Witnesses. I, I really enjoyed being a JW, and uh, uh, if it had been completely up to me, I probably would have still been a Jehovah Witness. Um, but God got a hold of my life when I was around 16 years old, and I started to uh, uh, making videos defending Jehovah's Witnesses. And so I was one of the original YouTubers. So you had a YouTube channel defending the Jehovah's Witness faith. That's amazing. Yeah, this was early, maybe 2007, when I first started making videos. Uh, I started noticing uh, online uh, more and more people like Christians and apostates who were making videos against Jehovah Witnesses. That really bothered me. And, uh, and I had a camera and I, and I had a YouTube channel. So I was like, you know what? I first made my YouTube channel with the intention of only doing video game related stuff because I was a teenager. Um, and so my, my handle was New Age Gamer 3018, I think. Um, and so most people knew me as that. And, uh, uh, and then I started making videos defending Jehovah Witnesses because I, I found that need there. And, um, and so, yeah, around early 2007, I think it was, I started making videos. So one of the first Jehovah Witnesses ever, I think I may have been the first Jehovah Witness ever on the platform of YouTube to actually show my face in defense of the Watchtower. Wow. Um, there were some Jehovah Witnesses that were making videos, but it was, you know, just their voice. Uh, it was behind, you know, a, a slideshow or something like that. Um, but I'm pretty sure I was amongst one of the first Jehovah Witnesses to show my face on YouTube actively defending the organization. I just lost power. So I'm doing this on my phone. It literally, the, my power went off literally about two minutes before we started. So I kind of had to go to plan B. But anyway, that that is so amazing that you were defending the faith. I found that out and that's just remarkable. But then what happened? How did you go from being a YouTuber defending your Jehovah's Witness faith to be, being a non-Jehovah's Witness? Yeah, you know, I started to debate a lot of Christians, um, some some pretty well-known Christians at that time on YouTube, like Shizulu, whose real name is Vincent, he's from the UK, and we would have these videos back and forth debating the deity of Christ, uh, debating, uh, you know, Christian uh, biblical doctrines and theology, um, and 
uh, I was, I thought I was doing a pretty good job. My videos are still up on YouTube defending the Jehovah Witnesses. I never took them down. I thought it'd be good to serve as a memorial uh, yeah. of sorts to uh, to show a progression of someone who started out as a Jehovah Witness and then kind of evolved into a Christian. And uh, um, and so through interactions with Christians, I started to open up my mind a little bit more and, and think, okay, well, let me let me look outside, just watch Tower of Literature. And, uh, and, I, and I picked up a, a very dangerous book called uh, Crisis of Conscience by Raymond Franz, who was a member of the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses in the, I believe in the 1960s and 70s, um, and left in, I think, in 1981. And he had a fantastic uh, book, and I felt really connected to his book in that I felt like he was very sincere. Uh, and one of the things that Jehovah's Witnesses always say is that apostates are insincere apostates hate jehovah's organization they hate jehovah's people and that's like the total opposite vibe i was getting from raymond franz in his book crisis of conscience i felt like he was extremely sincere extremely apologetic of saying i love jehovah's witnesses i i i I can't believe i'm on this side of the fence and and i'm struggling to even come across uh some of these things that uh that i'm speaking of and 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 i you know that's the perception i got from franz um, in his book. So I, I started to research more and I started to see that there was a lot of inconsistencies, the change doctrines, you know, the light getting brighter. It really seemed like the light was, light was getting darker in the organization. Um, things like the false prophecies that you just could not hold. You know, I forgot who says, who said this, this quote, I think it was uh, Walter Martin, but uh, uh, you know, a false prophet's worst enemy is his own literature or his own statements. Yeah. Um, and that's so true of the Watchtower organization. They just littered with false prophecies and changed doctrines. And um, if, if we were to use any, any consistent metric with any other religious group, uh, we would have no problem as Jehovah's Witnesses to declare a, a group or a person or an organization a false prophet had they had the same checkered pass that the Watchtower does. And yeah. so I felt like I was being inconsistent in my application of uh, Bible principles uh, with regard to the watchtower. I felt like I had to have one metric for the watchtower and be very apologetic for them. But if someone made the same mistake over in another camp, I can quickly uh, call them out for something that Jehovah's Witnesses have similarly done. Right. Absolutely. So about when was all of this happening? Like, like, for you to be able to, to grab crisis of conscience and read it. I mean, that's, that's a big step to be a Jehovah's witness and read apostate literature. So about when yeah. was this happening? Well, 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 the dirty secret is that um, I was reading apostate literature since about 2000 and 2005. So okay. right around the time that I got baptized, I got baptized in 2005 as one of Jehovah's witnesses at an assembly. And, um, Around that time, I was, uh, all the school libraries had computers. And I remember one day I was in school and I was like, I, would, I wonder what would, you know, what would pop up if I put in Jehovah's Witnesses? Wow. And like the whole world just opened up to me of all these things I'd never learned or never known about my own history as Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, and I started seeing a lot of apostate websites. I mean, it was terrifying. I mean, my stomach was just dropping. And to be a little bit crude, it, it was it, the, the feeling was as if almost as if I was watching something naughty that I shouldn't be watching. Oh, you know, yeah. that, that pit in your stomach of like, oh, I hope no one sees me researching this, even though I'm like the only Jehovah Witness in the school. I'm paranoid. And, um, but but reading and being exposed to those things actually made me double down more in my Jehovah Witness um, doctrine. And that's when I started making videos defending the Jehovah Witnesses. And, and I felt that's why I could deliver a pretty good apologetic for the organization was because I had already been exposed to some of this information. Um, but as I, as I grew and as I, I matured, um, I started to, to see inconsistency in my application of, you know, just very basic fundamental uh, arcs of reasoning. Uh, and so if, if, I, if I had to apply one metric for the watchtower and another for a different group, uh, I began to see those inconsistencies and, uh, and they began to worry me. I was like, I, I don't want to be inconsistent. I don't want to have these inconsistencies in my belief system. And so that's when I started to not only read Prices of Conscience, 
you know, what really did it for me was just reading the Bible. Uh, I remember a couple of times at that time in our congregation, we were going through the book of Revelation, the Revelation book, the grand climax at hand book. And I remember, uh, I think in chapter 10, there is a, uh, in Revelation chapter 10, there's uh, this angel who has his feet on land and sea, his head is arrayed with the rainbow, and you've got this yeah. really weird picture of him with his hand up like this in the, in the Watchtower book that has like a hidden face on yeah. the uh, and I remember pointing out that hidden face because of the, the website from uh, Rick Farron, the six screens of the Watchtower. I remember seeing that hand there. But then I also found the, the explanation for that text very puzzling. Um, you know, they explained that that angel that Jesus or that John saw was actually Jesus Christ. And Revelation chapter 10 says, uh, John says, and I saw and look, I beheld another angel. And I was like, okay, I get that Jesus is Michael the Archangel, but Jesus is not just another angel. Right. Yeah. He's, even from, from my perspective back then, I was like, no, Christ is way more unique than just being another angel. So this doesn't sit right with me. And I remember bringing it up to the elders. Um, you know, the best they could do is maybe uh, photocopy a magazine from <laughs> 1967 or something uh, to, to give me an answer. And I, I felt like that was just so uh, unsatisfying, the answers that they gave. And so I started to see, okay, maybe Jesus is not Michael the Archangel. Maybe Jesus is not an angel. Um, and that started to crumble the theology, the foundation of my theology as a Jehovah Witness, because what good is it really if we knock on doors, if we're, if we have the right eschatology, if we have the, you know, uh, you know, the right message about paradise, but we don't have the right Jesus. What does that mean for us? You know, the implications are way bigger than just uh, having the right expectation for paradise. Uh, it's all about Jesus. And I remember one time in the Kingdom Hall, I, I decided to take a survey of how many times Jesus and Jehovah were mentioned. And, uh, and I was thinking in mind of, of John 5, 23, that all may honor the Son just as they honored the Father. Mm -hmm. And uh, in that meeting, Jehovah was mentioned over 100 times, and Jesus was mentioned like four. And when he was mentioned, it was almost like in passing. Like, oh, and Jesus said this. Uh, but, you know, but Jehovah this, Jehovah that. And I felt like, man, there was just such an incongruent uh, metric. And, uh, um, you know, Jesus really is the, the, the center of scripture. If you read the new Testament, it's not, that ratio is not anywhere near what you'll find at the kingdom hall of what's yeah. being discussed. I agree. Yes, I definitely agree. I know I recap the study article, Meg, uh, the study articles every single week. And it's just, it's just amazing what they say about Jesus that pulls it. It's so subtle, but it pulls yeah. everything out of context, you know? So sure. now, did you fade? Did you get disfellowshipped? Were you PMO physically and mentally out? What happened next? Yeah. Uh, so what happened next is that um, I, I went to the Kingdom Hall and met with my elders. And I said, I have all these questions. I have these concerns, frankly. And I really was looking for them to answer them. I, I really, I, I gave them all the benefit of the doubt and said, okay, here's what I'm struggling with. Help me. Like, please help me. And uh, I remember just a cold face on the elders' faces. They looked to each other and, and, and they had no interest in helping me. They had no interest in, 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 in answering my questions. And I, and I genuinely came out of a place of, of, of uh, you know, genuine concern for my own soul. Uh, and so, uh, and I felt like they, they, they did not have that care and concern for me. And so at that moment, I decided I was never going to go back. And um, I decided to go uh, home and study the scriptures for myself. And, uh, and one of the, some of the questions that were uh, prevalent to me at that time were the issues of being born again. Um, mm -hmm. You know, how can we teach only the 144,000 are born again? Because that means we won't see the kingdom, whether on paradise or in heaven, if we're not born again, that's a huge deal. Um, and, and they of course don't see it that way. They feel like only the anointed are born again. Um, only they need to be born again. But that, that leaves the other sheep, the great crowd, in such a precarious situation. They have no covenant. They have no assurance. Uh, you know, they have no mediator except for the 144, which is nowhere in scripture. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's no different than the system that you see in Roman Catholicism with the uh, myriad of, 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 of mediators through the saints or Mary um, yeah. interceding for us. You know, there's always these steps before you get to Jesus 
Um, and, uh, and Jesus is never truly your mediator in that system. So uh, that was troubling to me. And so I start to, to research the scriptures and start to read the Bible for myself. And when I, uh, uh, one day in particular, I decided I was going to, wasn't going to go to sleep until I figured out who Jesus was. And so I, I start writing my notebook, reasons why Jesus is God, reasons why he's not God, just going back and forth and looking at the scriptures and really trying to get it. And then the whole day passed by and it's like two in the morning and I'm just so frustrated and I'm just so upset. And, uh, and I grab my Jehovah witness Bible. I have a, I'll show it to you. I still have it. This oh yeah. Kind of their, their study Bible almost. It's got like footnotes and stuff. And that was in, uh, Acts chapter seven where Dan, where Stephen is being martyred for his faith. And, uh, this is a text I had written, I had read no, numerous times as a Jehovah witness, uh, but again, it's like two in the morning. I'm tired. I'm frustrated. I want to know who Jesus is. And something came out to me for the first time that uh, um, that answered the question that I had. And it was this in, in Acts seven. He's, it says in the Jehovah Witness Bible, verse fifty nine. And they were and they went on casting stones at Stephen, as he made appeal and said, "Lord Jesus, receive my spirit." Now the word appeal here in the New World Translation has a footnote in this Bible. And the footnote says, prayer, okay, or prayed to. And so I thought about it. I was like, you know what? Appeal. He appealed. He spoke with. He prayed to Jesus. Right. I've, never, I've, never been, I've never been able to pray to Jesus. Right. I've always thought that you had to pray to Jehovah, the Father, in the name of Jesus. But never, I could never speak to Jesus. And it hit me for the first time. You know what? I could have just asked Jesus who he is. And, uh, and, the, and so then I just closed my eyes and the next words that came out of my mouth were Lord Jesus. And at that moment, I just knew, I just, I, got knew. Four times. <laughs> Amen. I just knew that he was God. I knew that I said, I said, God, I don't know how you are, what you are, but I worship you as God almighty. And I said, I repent of my sins. I trust in you. Forgive me for being part, part of this false organization. I'm going to use my life to serve you. And at that moment, I knew three things. One, that God, that Jesus was God. Two, that uh, I had been saved, that I, my life had been transferred from death to life, that something radical had happened in my heart. Um, and then the third thing is that I had to use my life to serve him. Um, and so those three things, God just confirmed in me right away. And it was like, uh, the only thing I can express or, or explain it is like a dam breaking and all this water just rushing out. And it was the water of the word of God washing over my heart and making me new. And so I got saved and I tell people all the time, I got saved using a Jehovah witness Bible. It's that God can work through anything, even a, a, a talking donkey. And he can even That's work right. through the new world translation. I know. I love that verse in Acts chapter seven, because I teach a Bible study in Acts with some of my viewers all over the world. And we read Acts chapter seven and that verse 59. And it says uh, in my, the Bible I was using, I think I was using the King James and Stephen cried out to God saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit, something like that. So yeah, yeah. It's amazing. That's beautiful. Yeah. After I became a Christian, um, it, it took several months for me to kind of um, completely fade. Uh, I was kind of keeping it a secret from my father because we were going to two separate congregations. He was going to a Spanish congregation. I was going to an English congregation. And, uh, and so he thought every Sunday that I, I was getting up early to go to the kingdom hall that our brother was picking me up. What I was actually doing is I was walking about two blocks down the street and having a Christian pick me up, taking me to their church. And I was uh, worshiping at this uh, wonderful church. Um, uh, it was an evangelical free church and the pastor there and the, 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 the folks there were just so incredible. And, um, and so one day, um, cause I was living at my aunt's house at the time as well. My aunt goes through my room and she sees the church bulletin mm -hmm. and uh, that I had brought home with me. Uh, and, uh, and so they knew that I was going to a church. So that was a big deal. Uh, and so they, they, I originally, I had just met one-on-one -on -one with one particular elder and he, him and I were, um, you know, he, he was, he was a nice, nice elder. He was, uh, I was elder clean. I think it was, he was a, uh, he was a really nice guy. Um, and so he kind of wanted to give me the benefit of the doubt and see where I was with things. At this point, I wasn't going to the kingdom hall. I hadn't been going in months. Um, and then he uh, um, kind of got pretty nasty towards the end when I expressed him that I didn't believe in the Jehovah Witness doctrines. I didn't believe in, in 1914. I didn't believe in anything that they taught anymore. And, uh, and he said with a really 
condescending smirk and voice. He's like, well, I guess you can go start your own religion now. And I said, no, I'm not Charles Says Russell. <laughs> so, oh, good comeback. Very good. Wow. Um, and then after that, a judicial committee was convened and uh, I had just given them my letter of resignation, a uh, disassociation letter, I guess. Um, so I was disassociated. Um, I read my letter to the Jehovah Witness elders. My father was in the room. That was really tough. Um, and uh, actually on YouTube, I have a video of me reading my letter with terrible quality audio. I mean, this was on a flip phone back in the day. Um, but I was outside the Keenum Hall and I read my letter uh, before I went in. And so, um, and so that's still on YouTube as well. Okay. And what was your channel name? Uh, right now, you can just put my name in, Brian Garcia, and you'll find my channel. Um, but uh, uh, my channel used to be called New Age Gamer 3018 because it was okay. originally supposed to be a game gamer YouTube you know, okay. site. But uh, I ended up using it for apologetics for Jehovah Witnesses and then Christians. Right. Amazing. Wow. What an amazing story. It's funny. She finds the church bulletin and, you know, it's like as if you were doing something really wrong, you got caught. Yeah, I mean, if, if it was like a, if it was a playboy, it wouldn't have been as bad. Exactly. You know? Exactly. I know. I remember when I was a kid and uh, growing up and uh, we would go on our school field trips to New York City. And um, along the way, maybe we were going to a Broadway play and we were walking from the train station to, you know, the, the theater. And on the way, we would stop at like um, St. Patrick's Cathedral to do a quick tour or something. And I was petrified. You know, or going there to go, going to St. John the Divine. I had to stand on the petrified, stand on the sidewalk outside, and everybody's like, "Come in, come in!" And you know, it was just terrifying mm. to be in, in a church or yeah. near a church. You know, so that's right. Yeah, um, when, I, when I went to my first church service, I thought I, I was kind of, even though I was a Christian at that point, I was still kind of scared that I was going to get jumped by demons at the door or something. Yeah. And. Oh, yeah. uh, yeah, it was kind of uh, uh, nerve wracking to go to a church and uh, it, it it took a lot. I mean, people don't realize how much it takes for someone like a Jehovah Witness to step into a Christian church. Um, I mean, they've been so heavily indoctrinated their whole lives that this is Satan's house, that this is uh, demonic, that this is uh, Babylon the Great, the harlot. Yeah. And so um, it, it's not an easy thing for someone to step into a Christian church and uh, and let alone worship God in a way that you know, your conscience is clear. So. Yeah. It's, it's great to be free, isn't it? It's Amen. just so to be free in Christ. So um, when I saw you at the conference, you, you spoke and it was so profound to me because, you know, we just passed the memorial. The memorial was back in April. I think it was back in April. Yeah. And April 15th. And you went to the memorial and you said something so profound about the observers, partakers. And tell me a little bit about when you went to the memorial and what happened. Yeah. Yeah. So today I'm a Christian pastor. I pastor a church uh, in Silicon Valley, uh, Reformed Baptist Church. And uh, I just moved here to the area. And um, I went, I decided to go to a uh, memorial service, which I hadn't gone to in a couple of years. I go every once in a while uh, as an opportunity to evangelize and witness to Jehovah's Witnesses. And, um, and so I went to the one uh, pretty, pretty near, nearby, and um, it was their first meeting back in two years. I mean, the pandemic, they've been just completely closed down. And, uh, um, and so uh, it was interesting to see all the Jehovah's Witnesses there and uh, wearing masks and being very cautious, uh, you know. Uh, but was, what was really interesting about that was the discussion I, I was able to have with the elder who gave the speech um, from the, um, uh, from the platform, we had about an hour and a half conversation after the, the meeting. Um, and so, so people know when I go to a Jehovah witness function, um, I don't play by the rules. Uh, some folks get pretty upset that I, uh, I don't tell them right away that I'm a former Jehovah's witness or that I'm an apostate. Well, first and foremost, I'm not an apostate. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to play by your rules. I don't, I don't uh, recognize the authority of the watchtower. Therefore, I don't have to live and, uh, and abide by their uh, man-made rules. And so I'm going to preach uh, the liberty of Christ. And, uh, and so I won't let anyone deter me from doing so. And so uh, I always, I, 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 in the world in which identification is so important now, uh, I always choose to identify as a Christian. Um, 
that's my that's my that's where I find my identity in. So uh, so I had a great conversation with this elder for about an hour and a half, and we just had a really deep discussion on the aspects of the memorial itself, such as the fact that Jehovah Witnesses don't partake of the emblems unless, of course, they're one of the 144. And I meant, I asked the question, okay, well, if the, only the 144,000 are in the new covenant arrangement, where does that put the other sheep? Where does that put the great crowd? Do they, are they in the old covenant or mm. are they in no covenant? And the elder responded, no covenant. Mm. And I said, then you're, then you're lost. There's no yes. salvation outside of God's covenant. I said, there's no hope. There's no assurance outside of God's covenant. God, God assures salvation through his covenant relationship. Uh, it's like saying, uh, you know, it's, it's almost like saying um, you can have the benefits of being married without being married. You yeah. know, uh, it, it, it just doesn't work. And so, uh, so I, we, we had a really fascinating discussion on that. And I think it was in my talk at the uh, Witnesses Now for Jesus convention uh, a couple of weeks ago that I mentioned, you know, all the Jehovah Witnesses are unwittingly uh, little Judases. You know, they're observers of the memorial and they're not partakers. You see in John 13 uh, verses uh, 21 to 30, uh, where, uh, where, where Judas is at the table reclining with Jesus at the Lord's Supper. And, uh, and he takes the bread, he dips it. Uh, but at that moment, the Bible says Satan enters him. Right. And, uh, and Jesus tells him to go do to do, go do his business, which is to get ready to betray him, essentially. Um, and so, uh, and then he institutes the commandment of the, of the Lord's Supper. He institutes that, uh, that new covenant arrangement. And, uh, and the only one who didn't partake of that table, a uh, member of the new covenant, was Judas. That is so profound that there was an observer. There was one observer amongst the partakers, and that was Judas. And wow, uh, when you said that from the platform, even though I knew that because Jesus had handed him the sop, the bread, and it never said, never said that he partook, but I never connected the two, that that was the observer. Mm, that's right, so that's right. Did, and so did you tell the elder this, that Judas was the, um, the, the one observer? Yeah, I mentioned that. I said, you know, you mentioned often about all these, you know, that we're observers and observers. And I said, you know, I don't really see that in the New Testament other than the fact that the only observer that was at the table was Judas. <laughs> and, uh, and he really didn't know what to do with that. And he was kind of taken aback by that uh, very much. And, um, and so I didn't want to push him on that because I didn't want to lose him, um, you know, because they can become easily offended and say, well, you know, but uh, um, but yeah, that's, the, that's just the reality, right? I mean, we don't see a precedent set. And I, and I tried to show him in the text, the text that he had read from the platform, when Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me, I asked, what is the this? What is this that we are doing in remembrance? Is it the, the passing of the plate? Is it, or is it the partaking, which is what the apostles did? Um, and so I said, you can't actually do this in remembrance if you're not doing the this, which is the partaking. Wow. It's just so profound. You know, I remember, I remember when I was a witness sitting there and he read it to take, eat, do this in remembrance of me and everybody would pass. It's just right. so diabolical. So diabolical. So did you, did you partake when you went to the memorial? You know, uh, I, I've only, I've gone to maybe four memorials. I've been out of the Jehovah Witnesses for uh, probably close to 14 years now. And um, I have partaken only once, and that was very early on, uh, probably in 2010, I want to say. Yeah, probably 2010, was a, I went to the memorial and I partook there. Uh, but I've, I've changed my stance on it. You know, I don't think that um, it would be appropriate for me to partake of it uh, because I would consider this as a false worship. And I don't, I don't think I want to partake in that. And so what I actually do every single time I do go to the memorial now, is that as they announce that they're going to start passing the emblems, I actually just get up and go to the bathroom where I step outside because um, I don't even want to have any part in even the rejection of it. So, um, uh, so, so that's what I typically do now. Uh, I do believe that the memorial today as done by Jehovah Witnesses is, is a false religious um, uh, worship. And so as a Christian, I don't want to partake in that. 
Right. And you know what? And it's another Jesus as well. It's Jesus, the Mike, you know, the Michael, the Archangel. It's it's a cre- Jesus, their created being. So I think if I were to attend a memorial, I wouldn't want to have any part in it either. I would excuse myself, but I'm not that bold. I'm more of a person who enjoys being behind the camera rather than face to face. I'm not that type of face to face evangelist or even protester or anything like that. I'm a bit shy. So talking to the camera. Camera, or talking to you behind the camera is more my comfort zone. So, sure. well, that's amazing. So you are a pastor. You're a believer in Jesus Christ as your savior. What about your family? How has leaving the organization impacted your family? You and your family? Yeah. Well, well that's, uh, uh, you know, not too different from most stories out of the Jehovah Witnesses, right? Most folks who have family members who are Jehovah Witnesses, um, you know, it's tragic. They don't talk. They don't, uh, have her, that relationship anymore. Um, I'm fortunate in that, um, I'm not sure it's because we're Latino, um, or, or if it's just, my mom is just so sweet. Uh, but I've always kept a relationship with her. Um, and we've always had, um, you know, uh, a pretty decent line of communication. Um, you know, um, But with other members of my family, for sure, uh, there's been a huge strain. Um, You know, I've got aunts and uncles who have not spoken to me in, you know, 14 years. I also have um, very staunch members of the organization. For instance, um, I've got aunt, uncle, and a couple cousins who live right next to Bethel in upstate New York um, by the Walk Hill uh, Bethel facility, which is the farm. And uh, one of my cousins, I'm pretty sure, is actually one of the main um, web designers for the JW.org website. And so uh, they're pretty, pretty high up in the organization structure. Um, You know, the JW.org is one of the most visited websites in the world. I think they get like, uh, you know, a couple. I I could be wrong on this, but the the statistic that the Watchtower has thrown out, I think at least once, was they get up to uh, like 7 million unique hits almost on a daily basis. So, I mean, it's not, not too surprising that there's 7, 7 million JWs in the world. And so they're all visiting the website every single day. But, uh, right. but it's still, that's huge. I mean, that's, 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 one, of the, that's one of the most trafficked uh, websites outside of social media. So, so yeah, so my family relationship um, in, in many cases have been, has been pretty poor, but uh, the Lord has been restoring some of those relationships. Uh, one of them, I think of my sister, um, who uh, has recently uh, uh, come to faith in Christ. And, um, you know, and I, I, and I, and I feel bad because I don't want to mention too much about it because uh, um, technically she's still in. She's, she's a fader. Uh, so she hasn't gone to the Kingdom Hall in years. Um, and, uh, um, and so I don't want to get her in trouble. So I, I get it. I understand. Trust me, I understand completely. Well, you know, I hear all of these beautiful stories and it gives me so much hope because I've been shunned, disfellowshipped, whatever. I wrote my formal letter of a disassociation and the elders refused to acknowledge it. So they waited a few months and then disfellowshipped me. So my family members don't know, don't know why. They just think I was disfellowshipped. I mean, they don't even know that I walked away because it's been more than 30 years for me. I don't know the third or fourth generations of my immediate family, which is, you, you scratch your head. You're like, wow, what? This is just beyond belief. You know, it's so diabolical, the darkness that they're on. But our God is greater and the light penetrates the darkness. So I'm just waiting for that phone call to come one day. You know, fortunately, my parents are still alive. They're old. They're up there. But you know what? It's still possible. So God is good. Amen. But anyway, I know that you uh, have a little bit of a tight schedule today. So I wanted to thank you so much for joining me. Is there anything else that maybe I didn't ask or maybe you wanted to share? No, I appreciate your time. And, uh, you know, if people are interested in the uh, ministry of our church, uh, we're here in the Silicon Valley area in Sunnyvale, California. 
and uh, part of Reformed Baptist Church, and we teach the scriptures, and um, we have a, you know, it's a, it's a place where people can come and learn more about Jesus and get a deeper knowledge of God's word, and um, and and so yeah, that's my main focus is the local ministry of the church right now. I do post videos on YouTube rarely, um, but uh, but I do occasionally. I still have a video I'm working on on the memorial that will likely be on YouTube in a couple of weeks. Um, it takes me a little bit time to do uh, videos because I'm just so busy in regular life, I'm married, four kids and uh, full time ministry and school as well. Uh, I'm in seminary at the moment. And so uh, I appreciate your time and, uh, and it's been a great experience. Great. Thank you so much, Brian.